Hi everyone, welcome to another talk um, in my series Bilingualism Theory. Um, in today's uh, presentation, we are going to talk about what happens when you stop speaking your language and um, talking about a phenomenon that scientific uh, researchers refer to as language attrition. So what is language attrition um, anyway? So in my talk, in my sharing with you today, I'm going to talk about some, you know, like uh, characteristics, some uh, symptoms, I would say, of language attrition. How does this look like? And whether, you know, it's a story that's shared by bilinguals or not. Um, uh, also, I'll talk about the definitions, um, what it is, and also explanations, some explanation available in the literature review. Also, we will discuss about, you know, the way to prevent this phenomenon from happening. And also we discuss with each other to hear what you think on the topic. So let's say language attrition is that there's, are they stories shared by all bilinguals? So let me, um, tell you my experience with this phenomenon. So for example, I remember calling my mom and dad and when we talk uh, with each other in Vietnamese, I start to tell them about my experience with um, uh, how the medical system works in the United States. So I'm saying something like, ở Mỹ khám bệnh xong người ta mới chạy tiền và công ty insurance sẽ chi trả. Nhưng họ gửi cho con một cái bill đòi gần 2.000 đô và con không bảo là con sẽ không trả nổi. Sau đó thì họ kiểm tra lại hệ thống thì mới biết họ chạy nhầm. So, is it you can see that if I have a translation of English here, um, even you don't know Vietnamese, you will see that there are some words that during my fluent speech, I just insert um, those words into my speech and it's, I, I did it in a very natural way, like I, I couldn't control it. Um, but the thing is when I become calm and reflect on what I have just said, there are two scenarios. The first scenario is, you know, oh, this is something I can totally can retrieve that equivalent words of these English words into Vietnamese. Uh, but I didn't opt to do it because it sound like if I, those words, I don't know for some reason, it's very hard to retrieve. And the, the, the thought of last four words just be replaced by um, the words in the second language, actually. Um, and so even I know the uh, translation equivalent, I still opt for the second language words, which is English. Uh, but the second scenario is sometimes when I reflect on those kind of speeches, I start to ask myself, um, what is that word in Vietnamese? Um, so it means that even though I pay attention to those words and I try to look back on my Vietnamese, I couldn't find the words. Those words just gone. So um, is that just, uh, you know, happen at the level of the words level? Or lexical level, uh, or this phenomenon can also happen in a larger scale. Like I would get lost for sentence structures or something, or maybe phonetic level, like the style, how to pronounce the words correctly. So let's see another sharing. Um, Um, so we are going to listen to uh, a story of a, of a um, speaker. She is a bilingual in Turkish and English. Um, but then uh, one day she's um, supposed to um, deliver speech in Turkish. And it seems like English just take over. So let's see her sharing.
All right, so with her story, you can see that this phenomenon is not just only on the lexical level, but it can happen as the abstract, as like the pre-verbal, with pre-verbal thoughts. Like you can feel like your brain, the kind of language, if you put thought in language, and it's even before you utter something, um, you feel like you're con you lost the control in a language and the other languages become more dominant, I would say. Um, and second, it can also happen at the phonetic level when you pronounce words. Um, at the syntax uh, structure or morphology code structure, um, when, you, when the morphology also has some grammatical function, um, and also as the uh, word choice level, as um, similar to my situation, when she feels uh, if she stopped to retrieve the word in Turkish, that would be too late uh, for the message to be delivered fluently. And then uh, she even say that English words can be much better in order to express what she intends to express because it conveys some conceptual meaning that hardly uh, be fully conveyed if she say it in Turkish for some reason. Um, so in many cases, um those are the things that happen when we refer to a phenomenon called uh, language attrition and it usually happen to the language that used to be domin dominant uh, so for english language learners or for learners uh, second language learners it actually happened to the first language to the language that you acquire first so Another term that has been connected with this is called first language attrition. But like I say, uh, there are two scenarios that happen. So there are actually two types of attrition that we are referring to actually. The first type is that uh, it seems like we know the existence of two languages and we feel like they are always active all the time. Why are they saying so? Because whenever I need to retrieve it again, it's there, it's not gone, it's there. It just, it slow me down if I want to retrieve it. Um, so this kind of attrition can be the outcome of two linguistic system that being competitive with each other. Um, and it just interfere when I need to utter something. Um, these kind of attrition phenomena will be connected with performance phenomenon or sleep of the tongue. Uh, but if we're talking about the second scenario uh, when attrition is mentioned, it seems like it's just, you know, the, another language is just fading. And fading here, I mean, like I totally get lost. And it seems like an erosion that reach the level of competence. For example, I used to I used to be, or I used to compare myself with the Vietnamese native speakers. And now I cannot do that anymore because I feel like there's a lot of changes. And even I feel the, domin the dominion uh, of the second language on my first language. And it's an indication of underlying grammatical knowledge in one system. Uh, in my Vietnamese has been influenced by the English and the English is so strong um, as well. So if this happened, this is the level of competence. And, um, the competence here is also include, you know, how I function in the context. When I go back to Vietnam, maybe um, the way that I function it, uh, the way that I think in, in language, and the way that I conceive something maybe is more dominated by even the conceptual aspect of the second language that rather than the first language. Um, so there's still like a debate uh, about these two definitions that have been put forward. But the most important thing is, you know, how research can distinguish these two phenomena. There's a blurring a blurring, a cutting, a blurring line between these um, phenomena. How can we distinguish that it's just a slip of the tongue or it's the cognitive erosions of our competence in one language? So in order to explain what's happening here, um, 
Do you have any、uh, hypotheses about that? What do you think about an explanation? Well, in this、uh, talk, I will share with you three common theoretical models of framework that have been adopted when it comes to the research on attrition. So, the first model is the regression model. The regression model is telling、um, is based on the fact that、uh, our memory has just You know, it's just some definite abilities to retrieve the event information. For example, it's very hard for you to know exactly、uh, what happened,、uh, you know, last year on this on this same day, for example. So basically, they would say that it is it's important to notice the other、uh, attributions、um, of something because if you learn something first, you tend to it's very vulnerable. You tend to forget it, right? Um, another alternative hypothesis of this framework of this model is also say that what is learned best that is least vulnerable to language loss. It means if you learn a language in a context and that context is very strong, very like for example emotionally provoked, or you have very personal experience with that aspect of language, it will not、uh, be easy to forget. But if You know, for example, you know a lot of words in Vietnamese, and then you don't practice those words, or those words are less likely to pop up to use in a context. You will tend to, um, you know, forget it. However, uh, this kind of order of acquisition and correlate with the loss of language is actually criticized, uh, because if Ah,、uh, we learn the language. We actually learn it from the concept first. So I learn what is the noun concept, what is verb concept, what is the concept of singularity or plurality, for example. Ah,、uh, so it should be the concept that be affected first, right? But actually, attribution um tend to appear and characterize more and more common with the. Performance level with with the products rather than the conceptual base, so that's why we feel like the conceptual base is still there, is still unaffected. And research also that the conceptual and communicative skill are relatively similar between an attributors and non attributors, so they are unaffected. What is affected is the lexical and grammatical system. So this framework ah、uh, seems you know questionable. The second framework is called language contact and language change. So it means that when you expose to the learning acquisition of the second language, you also learn its grammar, ah,、uh, also learn its syntax, right? So the thing is, your brain will start to form new habits of processing information. So actually, features that are coordinate in L one and L two, or if they serve the same semantic function on the linguistic level, I mean, ah,、uh, for example,、um, in Vietnam, you will tend to use more、uh, passive construction, but when you learn English and you intentionally navigate your language processing, ah,、uh, in more active mood, then. Then, um, there's very like different from each other. My Vietnamese is so different from the English. So if I knew English more, um, those will become you know like those will formulate the the habit. So my first language is still there, but the second language is just you know like it formulate my new habit of thinking in English and using English. So if the category. Um,、uh, that do not have an equivalent, um, in my second language, um, they will be lost. Yes,、yeah, so something in Vietnamese that do not exist in English, and if I don't have to use that structure, that structure will be lost and will be replaced, ah,、uh, by the second language. So basically. My brain is try to compact the information in a way that it seems like it helped me to remember better, um, and it's because it's very like intact. But the comparison and the process of eliminate something that not similar to each other, 
that process is actually harm me and make me forget my first language. Um, so for example, uh, I have a transcript of a Dutch uh, famous director and um, when, uh, but he moved to Germany later in his life, but uh, because, you know, um, the interview is in Dutch language and he is like over 100 years old. But when he started to, do, to, to he started to do this interview, uh, you will see that because Germany and Dutch has so many code names and also words that's even uh, structure, but basically like words or phrases. Um, and you can see here at the level of, sing, of, of like phonetics, like how you pronounce this is pronounced similarly. Uh, he just unconsciously and, un, and in an in, in, uh, unintentionally replace the Dutch word with the German words. Um, so the similarity between languages can be also a factors. Uh, the last uh, framework is actually borrowed by the uh, psycholinguistic study. So the Psycholinguistic study, they more focus on uh, to determine, okay, how can we decide or determine whether it's only a temporary phenomenon of interlingual effects? It's mean, like I say, people, bilinguals have the control of two languages and they always have that control. So this is just a temporary problem of accessibility. Um, uh, or is that an irretrievable loss? Like I, I lost this forever. So they try to see in which condition, which direction will happen. So they want to uh, come up with something like predictive power of their research. So usually they are experim experimentally conducted and uh, um, they try to showcase uh, the matter of activation and inhibitory control, more like asking the bilingual to elicit uh, the words in one particular category. And uh, they most of the study, they will show you what is lost and what is different between the bilinguals who have the language uh, attrition and compared to those uh, who seems to sound more like, still more like the first language native speaker. Um, however, recently, uh, they try to shift the, the conceptual pattern then. So instead of making the uh, people who experience language attrition as you know, an embarrassment or uh, make them feel very uncomfortable, the psychology's uh, psychological model want to focus more on, okay, then we know that uh, is the conceptual is unaffected. So even a person is, you know, uh, lost for words or lacking ability in the first language, what is to retain? What is to retain in their conceptualization? And is this possible that they can recover what they have lost? Um, because they also show that language used by adult at treaters is as complex as uh, in terms of more full syntactic pattern as non attributed uh, ones. So basically they are saying that if uh, I lose some aspect of my first language, as far as I know, I still have the abilities and even advantage to retrieve it and to um, make it balance again. So, the, this framework think that attrition is caused by temporary interlingual effects, and it just takes time to control and master what we call executive inhibitory mechanism. It means because we have one conceptual base, so it means we need to uh, control whether we are in the monolingual mode or bilingual mode. Uh, so as far as we see, this phenomenon seems to be aligned with uh, Keshe, 
uh, with uh, the the framework that we talk about. You know, one concept underlying conceptual base that is common for two languages, and there are more than two or three linguistic channels to express this. So a prevention for this, actually there's a lot of factors that we can take into consideration here to prevent it. Whether, so they figure out that it's um, easier to prevent attrition in, um, in adults or specifically in people who are, for example, who come to the United States for the second language immersion. Uh, it's easier to prevent attrition if they come after 12 years old because the age of six and to 11 and 12, that's where the knowledge of language is consolidated. So if somebody moved to uh, the second language environment before six or before 12, and the language attrition will accelerate. Also, they talk about length of residence. Um, so it's assumed that the more you stay in the US, for example, uh, the likely that you will experience attrition. Um, and the threshold is two years. Like after two years, you will start to have those symptoms. Um, however, as you can tell, this is very, very debatable. It's really hard. Uh, some people even they have uh, learned, uh, you see in the um, article that we read about the people who is like, who, uh, the Jewish and they still know the German, you know, it doesn't matter how long they, they far away from that country, from that language uh, and stay in another country, a long time of residence, but they still can control the language or know the language if they choose to keep it because it's attached to them emotionally, for example. We also talk about educational level, but again, it's very unlikely that one of this factor alone can explain the phenomenon. Uh, language, learning language aptitude, like somebody, they are more, um, you know, they, they, we call it, they have the talent, they have the natural talent for learning a, a language, like their brain is so fast or so, so quick, uh, so they can retain that language uh, longer, for example, so that is the learning aptitude. Um, but it's also, you know, it's more common when we say that language is, you know, always in contact with interaction and com communication. So uh, the people also who do not forget the first language in a particular um, category or concept is, is also depend on who they communicate with or what purposes. Uh, for example, the type of vocab that I easily forget is actually Vietnamese academic words uh, because all terminology I have le been learning in my field have always been English. So it takes me a longer time to actually, you know, look for the Vietnamese equivalents and in order to remember them again. So they start to get lost first um, because of that purpose. Also, like I say before, you know, the attitude, like if I still love Vietnamese and I love the show in Vietnamese, then I always have a good opportunity to maintain that. So that's, that's all about, uh, you know, language attrition. So I think um, after the sharing, some of the thoughts that we can think of is actually, do you think that this phenomenon only happens to people who are living immersing and using their second language in a second language speech community. For example, do you think that if I learn English in Vietnam, I will less likely to forget Vietnamese? Uh, in that case, why there is a difference? Also, um, you will see uh, one of the person who say, actually in the article, they say, my tongue couldn't get itself around words. Um, I would be able to understand clearly what people say to me, but couldn't formulate a sentence. So does language attrition always start with words and semantic skill uh, before they affect the syntactic structure? Or they always affect the productive skill, like communicative in terms of speaking, specifically before receptive skill, like reading and listening skill. 
uh, when they have to focus on saying bread and milk in English, they have built a mental barrier to block the Arabic version of the words. But then if they want to say the words in Arabic, they have to override uh, that inhibitory mechanism. That means you, you know that, oh, it's there, it's there. The Arabic there, words is there. I can still um, get across this. It's just the interlingual uh, effect. So I, but I must win over it first. I must win this cognitive processing to reach the Arabic person. Um, so if a person can practice and master that, uh, it means allowing the natural translation go through your brain every time you process language. That's one thing. And the second step is to decide when to use what. If you master this kind of mechanism, do you think that it will prevent a bilingual from his or her first language attrition? Any other ways to prevent that? Also, do you think when we use the term attrition, we actually cover uh, different populations who may experience this, right? So for example, second language learners, it would be different when you talk with uh, or you talk about the immigrants who must who who must in, in, for some reason immigrate to another country and, and use and have the attitude towards the target uh, environment language, right? So, what is do you think there's a difference between recovery and reacquisition um, when it's come to attrition, or is always the case that you recovery and then it's there or there are some cases that is severe as the competence level that we have to reacquire the language. Native language of immigrant changes not only across generation, like a shift in language use, but also within the life banks of the individual. What do you think about this statement? Uh, and as teachers, uh, when you teach heritage speakers, do you think that they have an advantage of maintain and keep their heritage, not just only about culture, but also language level as well. Um, also, besides the factors uh, that I just showed you before to prevent and to minimize language attrition, do you think what else will make one person a good maintainer and another a good attrition? And if so, how does the language attrition affect the language user feelings and attitude towards that language, for example, it's very weird for me to come back to Vietnam, hearing people saying something like, oh, I don't think you sound like a Vietnamese, or are you Vietnamese? Like you sound like a, a, a Vietnamese American. So it's actually not an easy feeling to deal with, but it's just like a fair feeling. And how does that affect their, uh, I, I, uh, their identification process? And also the, the confidence when they use that language. Uh, that it used to be their dominant uh, ability, dominant language. Thank you so much uh, for joining me this week, and we will see each other soon.